Welcome, everybody. My name is Tim Lord, and I'm the Congre in Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Um, this is a joint uh, Transatlantic Week uh, event held by, hosted by the Transatlantic Policy Network. Um, and the European Internet Foundation and the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. The European Internet Foundation is a group of members of uh, the European Parliament who, is ba who are basically the, the counterpart to the Congressional Internet Caucus in the European Parliament, and we're thrilled to have had such a, a long and, and, and fruitful relationship with them. Um, I, 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 this is the, we are, today we're going to do a roundtable discussion on privacy, security, and intellectual property and other matters um, that are of mutual interest to both the Congressional Internet Caucus and the European uh, Parliament's uh, European Internet Foundation. Um, I, I am very fortunate to have um, chairing this discussion uh, two leaders um, from both sides of the Atlantic. Um, Eric Amon and, and Congressman Rick Bauscher. Um, as you as all, you all know, Congressman Rick Bauscher um, is a co-founder of the Congressional Internet Caucus. Um, he, o over uh, tw 1992, he, cre he introduced the legislation that allowed for commercial traffic on the internet. He is, he is a, a leader in telecommunications issues. Um, he was in the United States House of Representatives for 28 years. Um, he is um, the, uh, the leader uh, for technology policy, every piece of technology policy in the past 30 years coming out of Congress has had his fingerprints on it, and we are delighted to have him today. Um, he is currently um, a partner at Sidley and Austin, uh, where is he heading up uh, telecommunications, internet, and technology issues for them. Um, also uh, with us, we have Erica Mann, who is a, a co-founder of the European Internet Foundation. Um, over, over 10 years ago, it was founded um, in, in Europe. Um, Congressman Bauscher and Congressman Goodlatte were actually at the inaugural event for the European Internet Foundation. Erica serves on the board of ICANN at the moment. Uh, she is also um, the head of European uh, efforts for the communications, uh, Computer and Communications Industry Association in, in Brussels, and we are, we are thrilled to have her as well. And with that, I will leave it up to uh, uh, Congressman Bauscher and Erica. Erica? No, you can do it right from right from this. Okay. Whatever you prefer. Good morning. Um, let me be very brief. I just want to make a short introduction to the speakers, um, which, we ha um, which we have with us this morning. And let me start with Pilar de Castillo. Um, actually, where is she? Pilar, where are you? Um, Pilar de Castillo is a member of the European Parliament, and she's the actual chair of the Internet um, Foundation. Uh, she was a former minister and she in, in Spain, and she is the coordinator of the conservative group in the European Parliament uh, in the Committee on Industry, Research, and Energy. Um, Catherine Troutman, Catherine Troutman, member of the European Parliament uh, from France, former mayor of Strasbourg, minister in, uh, former minister uh, in France. Um, she's a co-chair of the European Internet Foundation, um, and on, on the board as well. Um, Social Democrat and uh, one of our key person, I would say, actually say she's the key person on telecommunication uh, issues. Maritia Schake, member um, of the European Parliament from the Netherlands, a liberal, uh, uh, member of the Liberal Group. Um, Maritia Schake covers in the European Parliament many issues. She very recently joined uh, the trade uh, committee, trade committee which deals in the European Parliament with external trade related issues. Um, and she is one of our key members uh, in uh, on issues on intellectual property right and privacy related issues. Um, James Ellis will join us a little bit later. James Ellis is the uh, founder uh, of the Transatlantic Policy Network which is running the Transatlantic Week this week in Washington. Um, and he's a co-founder of the European Internet Foundation as well. Uh, he comes from the uh, he comes from the UK, um, and it's a it's a Tory. Um, really, uh, it's uh, part of the Tory group in the um, uh, in the European Parliament, and he's very familiar with all internet-related issue. His background is very different. Uh, he worked in the European Commission uh, as assistant to the Deputy Director General uh, of Agriculture. Um, so something similar, he, uh, he actually um, um, in, is the same like um, Bob uh, Goodlatte, which you know, has an agriculture background as well, and we always found this very funny in the past when the two 
Um, you know, we're talking about internet-related issues, internet uh, caucus in Washington and the European Internet uh, Foundation in the Europe, from the European Parliament, and we had two persons that, you know, covers both agriculture and internet-related topics. Um, and um, Ivailu Kalfin, he is not with us this morning. He is, again, another former minister, this time um, on foreign affairs uh, from uh, Bulgaria. He's a quite um, recent member in the European uh, Parliament, very active uh, on cloud computing issue and uh, issues which relate to security um, uh, topics. Um, and the last speaker um, is Mark uh, Bareka, whom you know very well, Senior Policy Advisor, Office of the Secretary, U.S. Department of uh, Commerce. Um, Mark Bareka has been a um, policy advisor uh, to Commerce Secretary uh, Gary Locke since uh, 2009. Very active knowledge in this field, uh, covers innovation policy, and actually runs in the um, uh, Department uh, of Commerce the uh, so-called Internet Policy Task Force. I think that's a great panel. Um, all key members uh, here, so which is uh, something you are very lucky to get an insight in European policy making and US policy making, very fresh, and you have all the key members and key speakers here, which you can imagine. With this, back to, uh, big, uh, back to you, Rick. Well, Erica, thank you very much, and I would like to join with you in extending a welcome to the United States of our friends from the European Parliament. Uh, Bob Goodlad and I have had the privilege over the years of coordinating with members of the European Parliament who have a particular interest in internet and telecommunications policy matters, and I'm very pleased we have the opportunity to carry on our conversation this morning. I, I regret that I have an unavoidable commitment that is going to prevent me from taking part in the second part of your panel discussion today but I will be here for the privacy and data security aspects of the conversation and for whatever questions there may be from the audience with respect uh, to those issues. Um, so Erica, with, um, with, with your um, agreement, I, I think we can proceed to that first conversation. And that is on the subject of privacy and data security. Uh, these are issues that have now become front and center in the United States Congress after a fairly long period of gestation. In fact, um, I joined with Congressman Cliff Stearns eight years ago in introducing the first bill that would provide a defined set of privacy rights for Internet users. And we have had various uh, refinements and new additions of that uh, legislative recommendation over the years since. Last year, uh, Cliff and I participated in circulating a discussion draft of the most recent version of the bill, and he has updated that yet again and introduced it in this Congress along with Jim Matheson. Jim is a Democratic member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and Cliff Stearns is a committee subcommittee chairman uh, on, on the Energy and Commerce Committee. And their bill is the leading measure in the House of Representatives that would confer privacy rights on Internet users. In the U.S. Senate, a quite similar measure has been introduced by John Kerry and John McCain, two very notable uh, members of the U.S. Senate who, through their stature, I, I think have helped to propel that effort forward uh, in the Senate. And I would note that President Obama has indicated his support for the passage of the legislation meaning that uh, th that measure really does have um, uh, a triangulation of support and, and, and critical uh, nexus of, of opportunity uh, to, to become law of this Congress. I think it's, it's very difficult in a fractious Congress like this to predict with any certainty what is going to pass and what is not, e even when you have the stars aligned in the way that you do for Internet privacy rights uh, given the fact that budget considerations predominate today and uh, the stakes are very high in those debates, uh, that's where all of the focus currently is and will remain for much of the rest of the Congress as new budget issues arise and will command an equal level of attention. Uh, but if anything that is not budget related has a good chance of passage, I would nominate this measure. Uh, because of the long gestation period I talked about, the fact that the issues are now well-defined and well-understood, 
there perhaps is a more urgent need than ever, uh, given some of the events that are taking place in the United Kingdom these days and may actually begin to be uh, reflected here on, on these shores also. And, um, and, and given the uh, level of presidential support that we see, uh, I think there, there's a very good chance for the privacy measure uh, to, to become law. I would note that uh, some of the major internet companies have expressed a strong interest in the legislation. And while I'm not sure that there are formal endorsements of the Stearns or, or, the, or the Kerry bills at this point in time, uh, those are, in, in my opinion, potentially not very far away. The internet companies have worked collaboratively with each other and also with the sponsors in shaping the earlier versions of this measure uh, which the current bills uh, very, very strongly reflect. The basic elements uh, that all of these measures pending House and Senate have in common uh, are these. This is the basic structure of the internet privacy rights legislation. First of all, there would be a requirement that companies that collect information from their customers disclose what information is collected uh, and how that information is used. So the use practices of the company that collects the information would have to be disclosed along with a specific identification of what information is collected. And there would have to be a prominent disclosure on the website of the company that engages in the information collection. So people would know what information uh, about them is, is being received by the company with which they do business. The second major feature is that there would be a, an opportunity for the internet user either to express consent for the uh, collection and use of that information or to withhold the consent. And that expression at, or withholding, as the case may be, normally would occur through what we call opt-out. And that means that if the internet user does nothing, then the information collection and use practice as defined by the company that collects it would be allowed. If the internet user wants to prevent the information from being collected or used, he would have to affirmatively click a box and say, do not collect this or, or protect my information or, or whatever the, the other uh, particular option might be in that case. And, uh, and of course, in a situation like that, the default position is going to be to do nothing. And that means that in the vast majority of instances, the internet company could collect and use the information in the way it has described. And that, of course, is the approach that the internet companies would prefer. They see that opt-out approach as being non-disruptive of their normal way of doing business. For some kinds of information, the legislation would require what's known as opt-in, and that is the circumstance under which the company could not collect or use the information unless affirmative consent for that had been expressed by the internet user. That means unless the internet user actually clicks the box and says, yes, you may do this, the company may not collect and use the information. Now that uh, higher level of protection would be afforded to things like what we call sensitive information. And that would be items like financial information, credit card numbers, social security numbers, any kind of government identifier like a driver's license, information that might lead to a revelation of um, religious preference, uh, sexual preference, um, possibly the, uh, the fact that the internet user might have uh, a disease of some sort. If, for example, a person has been visiting a lot of sites related to a particular kind of cancer, one might infer that that individual has that disease. And, and these sensitive categories would all be defined in the statute. And then before that information could be collected and used in, in any affirmative way, there would have to be uh, an opt-in. So that's sensitive information in categories well defined in the statute. The other area for which opt-in would normally be provided is the sharing of information by the website that collects it with unaffiliated third parties. Uh, now, an affiliated third party that you could share the information with would be a party whose um, transaction supplying ads, advertising uh, to, to the principal site, for example, might be necessary in order to effectuate a 
first-party advertising transaction. That is where the website that, that collects the information directly sends an ad to its customer. Uh, in the typical example here, that would be Amazon.com, with which we're all familiar, uh, that will advertise books or CDs or something that you have previously shopped for on that site to you when you revisit the site. I find that practice to be helpful. Um, I'm not an impulse buyer normally, but when Amazon targets my interest specifically, they may get me. And I've, I've bought lots of books and CDs and other things uh, from Amazon because of that targeted advertising directed to me. So I find it to be very helpful. I think a lot of people do. Uh, that's a first party transaction. And if you've got another company that is serving the ads to Amazon so they can serve them to me, we would treat the sharing of the information between Amazon and that other party as part of the first party transaction umbrella. So all of that could be accomplished under opt out. You wouldn't require opt in for that third party information sharing. We call that an affiliated third party. But if Amazon is going to sell this information to some company that it's not affiliated with at all and has no relationship with other than as a commercial entity wanting to buy the, the information, that could only happen under opt in. So the company can use the information for its own purposes, share it with people necessary to effectuate that own purpose. But if you share it beyond that narrow circle, uh, it would be subject to opt in. Now, I, I dwell on that at some length because to the extent that these measures are going to remain in discussion and there will be additional lines drawn around this, it's going to be around the the comparative use of opt-out versus opt-in, that's the core subject of conversation when you talk about Internet privacy measures here in, in the United States. Um, the other key thing that this legislation does is to say that the state laws on this subject would be preempted to the extent that they're inconsistent with the national measure. And so you would have uh, a uniform national standard preempting the state laws and companies that collect information would have to comply with that national legislation. Fairly good chance of passage. If you're interested in the subject matter, watch what happens with Stearns Matheson in the House mm -hmm. and Kerry McCain in the Senate. I'm going to mention briefly the other core subject, which may be a fellow traveler with this one, and that is the subject of data breach. Uh, in May of this year, we had the second largest data breach uh, of which we're aware in history. The largest was Choice Point several years ago. The second largest one was the Sony data breach. Mm -hmm. And in that circumstance, a lot of files, millions of files, that contained credit card information um, were uh, uh, purloined from, breached from the Sony PlayStation uh, <coughs> accounts. And um, and that received a lot of public notice here in the United States. And I think that event has given a, a lot of momentum and created traction for the passage of data breach legislation. The legislation is pending today in the House Subcommittee on Commerce, uh, Consumer Protection, and Trade. It's chaired by Mary Bono Mack from the Palm Springs area of California, uh, a, a Republican who's willing to, uh, to put uh, policy above politics. I always admire that. As a Democrat, you know I'm, I mean it when I say it. Um, and she was the, the sole Republican on the House Commerce Committee, I might point out, to vote for our climate change regulatory measure, our greenhouse gas cap and trade bill, in June of 2009. Uh, I admire her enormously. I think she's fully capable and, and, and very uh, knowledgeable about the, the subject matter, and she has introduced her own data breach bill. Uh, it is her subcommittee that would also consider the Internet privacy measure. And because each of these measures has an independent traction behind it, I anticipate that there's a very good prospect that at some point in the process, these measures could be joined into a uniform bill processed through subcommittee, full committee, and the House, and that action repeated in the Senate. Uh, her legislation would do three core things. It would uh, define the security requirements for any company that collects sensitive information like credit card information from customers. It would specify what a notice must contain in the event that there has been a data breach. And it would specify when that notice must be given. What is the volume of information that would be breached in order to trigger the notice requirement? And what kind of information 
when breached would trigger that notice requirement? How sensitive does it have to be? I think in the end, uh, companies that collect data may prefer to have a national measure such as hers because today they are having to comply with a multiplicity of often conflicting state laws. The state laws govern this entirely in the U.S. today, and it's very difficult for a company in the event of a data breach first to comprehend all of these state laws and then comply with all of these various state requirements. Having a uniform national standard that preempts the states and creates something that is a clear, bright line for these companies to follow gives them a measure of protection and makes it much easier from a transactional standpoint for them to manage and comply with the law. So if you're interested in data breach and, and Internet privacy rights, watch the House Energy and Commerce Committee and the subcommittee that Mary Bonomac chairs. Uh, you're likely to see some action there during the course of this Congress. Erica. Great, Rick. Wonderful, like always, perfect and brilliant overview. Uh, Pilar, do you like yes. to give the overview for the European Parliament? Yes, um, I try to do it and do it uh, briefly. Um, well, from the side of the European Parliament, the first thing that uh, has to be said is that uh, the, the legislation we have is really old uh, in terms of uh, how much uh, development we had of uh, new scenarios uh, for exchange any kind of things and develop any kind of business. Um, that legislation comes from 1995, which, as you can imagine, so many things there is in between uh, that uh, in many aspects is an old uh, legislation. So the Commission is currently in the process of reviewing, reviewing uh, the general EU legal uh, framework on the pro personal, uh, protection of personal uh, data. And I uh, have to just uh, outline the, the main uh, objective of uh, this uh, new uh, or the future legislation, which now is in process of uh, being debated uh, at the Commission level. And the first uh, is modernize the EU uh, legal system for the protection of uh, personal data, in particular to meet the challenge uh, resulting from globalization and the use of uh, new technology. That is the main one, since uh, we, I mean, come from a time in which the Internet uh, didn't exist. Uh, second, uh, strength individuals' rights uh, and at the same time reduce administrative formalities to ensure a free flow of personal data within the EU and beyond. And third, improve the clarity and coherence of EU rules for personal data protection and achieve a consistent and effective implementation and application of the fundamental rights to the protection of personal data in all areas of the Union's activities. So that is the main uh, pillars in which uh, all these uh, debating are taking place. But I would like to mention uh, some of the problems that, uh, in my view, um, uh, quite uh, uh, to a large extent shared by uh, many people and many sectors, business sector. Uh, we have a problem uh, with uh, the fragmentation of uh, legislation at the European Union level. That fragmentation, which is not only in the field of uh, protecting personal data, it is in, in many, many, many others, uh, are uh, posing barriers uh, for the developing of a true uh, single market, which is at the core uh, of uh, the, uh, you know, of the project of creating the European Union. So, in that uh, sense, uh, we are indeed in a situation in which uh, we have already uh, 27 uh, environments for uh, develop, the developing of uh, the market. Uh, so that means that uh, when a company tries to really spread through the European Union and try to get uh, all the uh, benefits and really seize uh, all the opportunities uh, of having such a market with a potential of uh, 500 million consumers, uh, they immediately find that they are in not such a context, but uh, with, uh, have to deal with uh, 27 boxes, uh, which, uh, you know, they have their own legislation, and so they have to ask, uh, fulfill in case of a dispute, uh, you know, the, according to each uh, jurisdiction and each uh, uh, regulation, 
<coughs> or they have to uh, ask for license, uh, you know, in the 27 boxes and so on, so on. So, uh, so I think uh, in terms of uh, the, the data, uh, the European Union now face uh, two uh, challenges. One is to modernize because it's, uh, you know, 15 years old. Uh, and in, in, in this time of uh, the history of humanity, it's too much, 15 years old. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, which is of extremely important, is uh, the, to, to, to harmonize uh, legislation in a way in which uh, the, the single market can really uh, provide with all the uh, and, and extremely uh, uh, excellent possibilities, I would say, for the European companies uh, and for other companies as well, not only the European, the outside companies, to, to take advantage of this uh, market of 500 million uh, potential consumers. So um, I think they are the two main, in, in broad term, uh, uh, challenge uh, we have. And then, on the other hand, we can, uh, we can uh, since we are here in, in the context as well of the Transatlantic Week, which has been designed for boosting the cooperation uh, among the legislators of uh, the two uh, sides of the Atlantic, uh, to what extent we have a chance to, um, to approach our views on data protection. Uh, for example, let me put an example linked to uh, what we can call a trending topic, uh, cloud computing. Uh, when dealing with cloud computing, um, well, we have, uh, we are going to have, when this, all this new technology is fully developed, we are going to have uh, different ways of data protection according to, finally, which is the jurisdiction uh, of uh, the cloud. Uh, that uh, we have storage or use uh, in terms of, uh, you know, software, hardware, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, this, is, uh, this is a problem uh, because it's a problem to some extent. Some uh, of the cloud, according to the legal rules, they, are, um, they, they have to, 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 to fulfill, uh, 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 will be, um, Imagine is under the jurisdiction of the uh, U.S. or the European Union. In the case of U.S., uh, the data protection uh, has some uh, limits uh, if some kind of uh, data, uh, some kind of uh, problems like, uh, well, I don't know exactly the uh, Union Patriot Act when can intervene, but uh, it poses a limit to the privacy of the data and then the possibility for the government to intervene uh, in those uh, data. In the case of the European Union, uh, the system of data protection is uh, very rigid in the sense that extremely protected. So no one really can, uh, from the uh, authorities, from the institutions, from the government, so so, can enter into that. Uh, to the extent that um, in some uh, debates, uh, some people said, well, this is a competitive advantage uh, compared to a system in which uh, the, the government has some uh, possibilities to uh, enter and to know the data under uh, specific circumstances. Uh, so, if uh, well, it is an argument that yeah, I, I am finished. Uh, that uh, is is on the floor when we debate in that in Europe. But what could be a competitive advantage to have such a strict a way of protecting the, the, the privacy in the clouds uh, that are uh, under the law of the European Union. No? So uh, I would say that uh, that would be fine, but I don't see the, the possibility really to approach much uh, now the views on data protection uh, in both sides of the Atlantic. But what for sure is, is not only uh, possible, but it is an urgent need, is to do that at the level of the European Union and harmonize legislation in order to really have a context and environments that boost the full development of the internal market. That's all. Thank you so much, uh, Pilar. I'd like to give the floor to Mark um, uh, uh, Bayman to ensure, and Bareka, and uh, sorry to confuse the two names of you, and Marvita Schake. Um, very briefly, because we are running out of time, and I want to make sure that we have still a question and answer session as long as Rick Bauscher is with us. So Mark first, and then you, you fine? Oh, wonderful, Marie. Great. Thank you. I will be brief. Um, 
and I, I think it's helpful for the two previous speakers to have laid out the details in the way they did because it sets the context well. Um, in particular, I appreciate the historical perspective. Um, I remember uh, maybe it was nine years ago there was a, uh, a version of this event in Brussels and uh, Congressman Boucher, you might not remember dinner, but I do. We had this uh, animated conversation about privacy and privacy legislation. At the time, I was on a in a different role on the other yeah. side of the table, if you will. And uh, fast forward nine years, if you can fast forward nine years, and the world has changed. And uh, we do have an administration now that has categorically endorsed privacy legislation. In fact, uh, today, um, one of my colleagues, Larry Strickling, who runs the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, part of the Commerce Department, is on the Hill testifying uh, before um, Chairwoman Bono Mack and is uh, articulating the administration's current views. Um, in, in short fashion, the administration views are still uh, in, in gestation. Um, we are uh, working on a white paper. Um, we, in the administration, borrowed a concept from the Europeans whereby we uh, developed and published uh, last year uh, some initial policy recommendations uh, in a green paper and sought additional input from stakeholders. And uh, taking that additional input, uh, we hope to produce a white paper with a, a formal Obama administration position on some of the details of, of uh, privacy policy, um, public policy. Uh, by the end of the summer. And so people are hard at work finalizing that document. Uh, before we get to the final position, though, we've already staked out certain things that we think are essential. Uh, in line with some of the comments that uh, Congressman Boucher made, the administration has said categorically that there ought to be baseline legislation uh, that acknowledges certain uh, uh, privacy rights. There ought to be a consumer bill of rights relative to the protection of their commercial data. Um, second, uh, we've, we've said that uh, in this, in this uh, con continually innovative space, uh, legislation can't anticipate all circumstances. Uh, and therefore, when it comes to uh, un unique um, applications of technology, unique sectors, uh, emergent sectors, rather than regulate or legislate, uh, we ought to actively engage in multi-stakeholder conversations to develop uh, rules of the road or guiding principles for those emergent sectors. So cloud computing may have some unique uh, privacy considerations, uh, as might um, uh, location uh, information services uh, might have its own unique considerations. So rather than regulate and legislate in each of those, our proposal is that multi-stakeholder groups uh, be convened uh, to develop best practices in each of those unique areas. Thirdly, um, to, to um, ensure that those best practices uh, take root, uh, we would support uh, stronger FTC enforcement uh, so that when an entity stands up to those stands up and, and, and says they will follow those best practices if they don't, there would be FTC enforcement. And similarly, uh, using the baseline legislation as a platform, the FTC could go after outliers and, and finally have um, uh, that categorical statement in law uh, that, it, uh, that it may enforce certain privacy principles against commercial uh, actors in the United States. Uh, lastly, an, an important element of our, of our privacy uh, um, uh, uh, menu is, is aimed at fostering uh, global interoperability. Um, we appreciate the fact that the Europeans are uh, methodically working through their directive to update it. And as they do so, we enjoy any opportunity that we have to, ha to uh, dialogue over how we can bring our systems closer together so that we can foster um, um, even greater free flow of information transborder, and that we can avoid fragmentation, not just fragmentation within the union, uh, but fragmentation as between regions. And then um, to the extent we get into it in the Q&A, uh, I'm happy to talk about the administration's uh, position on cybersecurity. Uh, similarly, the administration has stood up and said, yes, 
there, there ought to be a collection of legislative reforms that improve uh, the cybersecurity posture uh, of the United States. Uh, the administration supports uh, data breach legislation. Some of the details of what we support are probably not, you know, completely in line with the details uh, of bills that have been uh, uh, put forward uh, in Congress. But I completely agree with uh, Congressman Boucher that uh, we are close. And uh, if we found the right catalyst, uh, we could probably uh, push legislation forward. Thank you so much. Question and answer. Please state who you are. Yes, please, the lady here. Um, hi, my name is Julie Rose, and I'm an attorney in Washington. Um, my question is in two parts. Um, in terms of policy for health searches, um, it seems as though you wouldn't want to discourage people from um, that activity by able to take a search and um, have it there or discourage it because the information is being collected. Is there any way that quantitative versus the identity information can be considered and the identity um, weighed so that there's not a discouraging um, I guess, aspect of doing those kinds of searches. And the other uh, question is, um, I was recently in New York at an Internet Society conference in which Vince Cerf had mentioned uh, the possibility or the need for authentication to occur on the Internet for privacy reasons. And so whereas uh, privacy and security intersect, um, he had advocated that credit card companies be utilized because they've already set up a system of authentication and they uh, it would not cost because they have already created that infrastructure. So has there been any consideration of those kinds of uh, matters? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I suppose maybe Mark and I should take part in a answering your question. L let me just offer a few thoughts that I have. First of all, on the subject of discouraging normal business activity, including searches, um, a careful balance has to be drawn here between providing a series of well-defined rights for Internet users and at the same time making sure that in observing that law, uh, companies are not inhibited in their ability to carry out the kinds of targeted advertising that support the Internet today and the provision of free content and at the same time provide a real service to users. I was talking earlier about the benefits that I see from targeted ads that, uh, with which I have some personal experience being directed toward me. And, and I think we do not want to disrupt that kind of legitimate activity. When we circulated our discussion draft last year of an updated version of this legislation, uh, there were comments from both sides of the spectrum Consumers said, you haven't gone far enough. Uh, Internet advertisers said, you're going to put us out of business. And uh, because we got that kind of comment from both directions, I kind of felt like we landed in the right place. We were pretty much in the center of, of opinion. Uh, and, and the more thoughtful people we were working with, I, I think, agreed that we had a, a pretty good product. It's been modernized now. But, uh, but I, I think that demonstrates the need for care to make sure that whatever we do is not disruptive of the kinds of targeted advertising that I think everyone agrees are helpful to the Internet as we know it today in terms of making content available for free and also providing that very valuable consumer service. Mark, if you want to add to that, I, I think your comments would be welcome. Sure. Uh, I'll just quickly add on the search question and then uh, switch over to authentication. Um, on search, um, you've asked a, a a specific question about search as it relates to health information. And just as an aside, you should know that in the United States, um, we, we do have law and regulation covering uh, vast swaths of, of the healthcare industry and how they move data back and forth. Um, search um, uh, likely, I don't want to speak as an authoritative lawyer on this topic because there are plenty, plenty of lawyers in this room who could deal with this more tactfully than I can. Uh, but generally, uh, search falls outside those bounds. Uh, and so uh, what, what we envision in our framework is that um, stakeholders would come together and develop best practices, like I said earlier, for uh, uh, species, for types, for categories of activity online. 
and so speech is an act, or excuse me, search as, as an activity um, may, may raise certain uh, uh, privacy concerns in the context of search and health information, but it also probably raises concerns in the context of search for other types of, of information as well. Um, uh, anything gender specific, anything religion specific, anything politically speech or financially specific probably gets into some very sensitive areas. And so under our framework, what we would suggest is that uh, the uh, major search entities and other stakeholders come together and identify best practices for that, cat, that, for that type of, of activity uh, and then hopefully sign up to them and, and, and then uh, hold themselves up to enforcement by the FTC. So that's how search would fit into our framework. Uh, as, as to authentication, um, you know, we are in, in a, in a uh, period of ferment, I would say, within the administration when it comes to a lot of these uh, tech issues that have been simmering along for a decade or more. And um, we, are, we are advocating legislation in certain circumstances, but then as an administration, we are doing what we can where we feel that legislation is not absolutely necessary. And in the authentication space, uh, the administration uh, feels that we've got the existing authority and the wherewithal to better promote the use of authentication when people go online as a cybersecurity enhancing tool. And so uh, um, the president has actually signed um, a, a statement uh, encouraging the administration to in turn encourage the private sector uh, to develop a multiplicity of authentication, interoperable authentication tools so that when people do go online, they use an authentication tool and in the process significantly improve the security of, of, of their communications online. And I want to emphasize uh, that we promote uh, op an open market for these authentication tools um, and that we are working towards um, both fostering that market but also assuring an operability so that there's ample choice. You know, I carry, I carry my federal government authentication tool. It's issued by uh, the, the Department of Commerce. You know, I, I carry my state authentication tool, my driver's license, and I carry multiple credit cards, which are all authentication tools, potentially. And so if we were all collectively or individually using these tools when we got online, we would improve the security. And if we all have uh, a multiple multiplicity of choices out there, then there's uh, room for innovation and competition. And we are pursuing that as an administration. That's what Mr. Cerf was referring to. Ed Black with CCIA. Um, it's hard to have a conversation about privacy with not remembering the recent headlines of what's going on in the UK. Um, and I think it raises a specter from what we've heard that there is, in fact, one aspect of intrusion, uh, which is really gathering data to use in in a really adverse political way to intimidate, embarrass opponents, et cetera. Um, and I think while this discussion is very important and focused on, so far, the private sector aspects of privacy, I think a real discussion of privacy also has to focus on what kind of limitations and protections does the average consumer have from unwarranted or excessive governmental intrusion into privacy. And also, even in the Internet space, if you were that quasi area of the Internet service providers, so it's not just websites, but in fact, ISPs actually know everywhere you go and everything you do on the website or on the internet, whereas websites only really capture you when you're, you're in their part of the universe. So the role of the ISPs in privacy and, and frankly, if you're looking at privacy from the standpoint of how do you protect the privacy of the average citizen, you have to ask how do you protect it from governmental uh, excess as well. That's a great question. In the legislation that we had drafted previously, we talked about any entity that collects information from Internet users. Uh, any entity logically could be extended to include government. But candidly, we never really had this conversation because the focus was on commercial activity. Um, but I, I think it's, uh, it's an important conversation to have at this stage as to whether or not there ought to be some ability of the Internet user to deny government accessing information where government is seeking to do that. Um, 
I, I have no doubt that if it, if it was a government website where an individual went to the website in order to acquire a government service to apply for a passport or something from the Department of State, for example, that uh, that kind of transaction would have been covered under the language of the legislation we previously recommended. And I haven't um, carefully looked at Cliff Stern's newest version to see whether um, that's changed. I, I would assume it's not. And so where you're going to a government website for the purpose of acquiring a service, I suspect that was covered under our earlier measure. The Department of Commerce wanted to share the, that information about you uh, broadly. It would have to comply with the same rules that the private sector entities would have to comply with in a similar situation. Um, but, but I think you've raised an important question. Should there be some greater protection extended, particularly in light of the events that we're seeing transpire today? Mark? Gentlemen, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have you all. Please, don't worry. <coughs> we do have 10 more minutes, but so keep the question short. Thank you very much. This is Justin Weiss. I work on international privacy at Yahoo. And my question relates to the transatlantic relationship on, on privacy and the discussions about convergence. We know from the 1995 European Directive, we have the concept of adequacy to describe how data flows ought to work um, to foreign jurisdictions. And um, we have, from both perspectives, the existing instrument of safe harbor. And I'm interested in the future direction that we're describing on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, if there are, are thoughts or reflections on the future of an adequacy requirement, or if that may be reviewed in the new legislation. And in light of the administration's position on comprehensive privacy legislation, uh, what the feeling is about the ongoing role that the treaty would play um, for that interoperability. Safe uh, harbor, uh, there is, I don't know, from the side of the companies, what do you think about? But I think uh, the evaluation from the commission is uh, is good, it's properly working. So it, I don't think uh, this is, in this moment, uh, you know, regarding this uh, review of the 1995 uh, directive, uh, you know, something that is going to be in the, at least in the top of the list, you know, so I don't, I don't see, as far as I know, that the, the sea, uh, safe harbor is going to be reviewed. That was, uh, I can, I can uh, tell you, you know, I don't think uh, that is. So, on the other hand, uh, I think, uh, well, for the flow of information, uh, I f fully agree with you in terms of, you know, the interoperability and common standards and this kind of thing that is absolutely indispensable. But this is, uh, you know, uh, how to deal with other aspects, not exactly with data uh, security. And um, that, that, that is, I mean, I, I, that, that is my impression. Uh, anyway, we have to wait because, you know, the Commission is the Commission, the European Parliament is the European Parliament, and then, you know, until the Commission really don't put together uh, you know, a new uh, proposal, we don't really know much about how things uh, are going on now in terms of uh, debates inside. I, I would completely agree, and I would I just add a little color in that. Um, as, as, as much as it seems like there has been talk about um, fostering interoperability between the European and the U.S. privacy framework for quite a while, for uh, over a year at least, um, we just have to be realistic that it, it will be somewhat of a, a long dialogue. Um, and so we are, in some respects, still in early days. Um, we are working on our policy here in the United States. The Europeans are working on their uh, policy revisions over there. At the same time, we need to be cognizant of each other's work and uh, do what we can to uh, bring those those uh, revisions together to make sure they're interoperable. But it will take some time. And I would encourage people to continue to stay engaged <laughs> on both sides of the Atlantic because I think having stakeholders, whether they're private sector or NGO, uh, continually uh, telling us their views on both sides of the Atlantic, it, it helps that weaving together process, but it will take some time. Let, let me just add one, one footnote to that. I, we do have a very sound history between the U.S. and the EU with negotiating safe harbors. Um, I, I recall the process uh, where I was involved to some extent in the conversation back 
more than 10 years ago when we negotiated the safe harbor to allow financial information to flow from the subsidiaries of U.S. financial companies located in Europe back to the United States. And that seems to have worked well. So we do, we do have a good foundation for negotiating safe harbors. And that was done in the absence of defined Internet user rights here in the U.S. So I think once we pass legislation that creates a standard for Internet user rights here, it simply makes the negotiation of future safe harbors easier. Uh, I think it has that positive effect. Katarine, and for the gentleman standing in the back, we have many seats here for you. There is, um, of course, an evaluation of uh, these uh, disposals by uh, the Commission, which uh, which must be done. But the uh, the fact is now uh, the Liberty Committee in the European Parliament wants to look uh, with uh, a lot of attention on all the aspects of uh, you know respect of uh, privacy in the different uh, texts. So the question of safe harbor is not in principle in question. But there are some aspects, as the transfer of data, uh, which are more critical in the discussion. Yes, and maybe at one final point, because you asked um, what we discussed this week at the Transatlantic Week. Um, and I think there was an interesting discussion um, which really um, you know, argued, uh, many, many of the speakers, that it would be good to look even beyond uh, the transatlantic relationship between Europe and the United States in this field but to capture more the international environment as well. Uh, and we got signal that something is uh, looked at. Uh, many think tanks are looking into a World Trade related or other international related framework for e-commerce, which might look into the treatment of um, specific data or safe harbor principle as well. Now it's a very early stage, so don't get me wrong. It's very early evaluation, but I think it's interesting uh, that the two sides agree to look more closely into the subject. Uh, thank you. My my question is for the members of the European Parliament. Uh, just like uh, Congressman Boucher has given us his views, uh, his has given us a nice outline of what uh, currently is going on with regard to privacy and data security and the acts that are going to hopefully be passed. Uh, what is what is the current? Uh, you you've outlined the problem. So what are the current uh, steps that you guys? Uh, what direction are you you guys going to follow? in terms of data security and privacy? Is it, is it in line with uh, the United States, or are you taking a slightly different approach? Because I think with, uh, with the scandal that's uh, erupted now, there will be a lot of pressure moving in that direction. Someone who wants to love just to give a short insight what is going on in the yeah. uh, inside the parliament committees? Yes, well, um, I think uh, I failed because I tried to, to explain that at the very beginning, you know, yes, a very general insight on how, what is uh, going on. And uh, what I think it's in terms of data protection, data security and protection of data, I mentioned that uh, the approach of the uh, European uh, Member States and then the European Union is more strict in the way that normally you need uh, to go to a judge or to have a judicial um, document in order to intervene and to know about that. You have a more, uh, you know, in some exceptional location, uh, different uh, ways. I mean, you can intervene without that, uh, depending on you. You consider according to your legislation that you are in a situation in which you need to do that. So uh, this is a different approach, I mean, in that sense. Uh, but uh, And this is shared by all member states in the European Union. The problem we have beyond that is the modernization, since internet was not there. This is a problem. And then we have also the problem of putting really an harmonized uh, you know, piece of legislation because all the problems of having such a fragmented uh, legal market among other things. So I think in terms of precisely precisely the, 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 the way in which face data protection, we have more uh, you know, uh, need for having a judicial intervention in order to intervene on the data while you have another. So that could be one of the, of the, of the aspects you know, which difference one another one. Yeah. 
maybe what's going on in the committees right now, please. Yes, I spoke about the transferability of data. There is another point, which is the retention of data. We, we have a directive on, on retention, and, and this uh, will be uh, uh, examined, uh, you know, in the context of the new uh, approach. Uh, secondly, uh, the uh, Libe Committee wants to uh, work uh, also with the INTA Committee, that is uh, external commerce, on the uh, reference to the um, uh, human rights and fundamental rights. This is a key issue uh, between the uh, United States and, and Europe uh, because uh, sometimes we don't have uh, the same, uh, you know, clear definition of the respect of the fundamental rights. And uh, it's sometimes difficult to write because we have text, uh, we have bills, we have uh, references. So, but we must converge on that because uh, uh, in the Intact Committee and with the new uh, Treaty of Lisbon, uh, the Parliament can say yes or no for an international treaty. It was the case with SWIFT when we refused to vote in favor, we voted against and it was an obligation to change the content, and we can do it on ACTA treaty if we don't agree with the result of the negotiations between the United States and the Commission. So uh, this is a key issue because now uh, we, the Parliament is very much in favor of having uh, what we call safeguard clause that is about fundamental rights, social rights, environment, uh, environmental uh, conditions. And this is, of course, uh, something very uh, critical in the discussion, accepted by the United States, but, of course, one um, a question uh, in discussion. So uh, we are in the moment in this elaboration of our doctrine, if I can say, and this is at first a discussion with the Commission and the Member States, and then a discussion um, which can interfere in the international uh, you know, discussions on treaties. The gentleman here, and then I will close the session on, on privacy. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Erica. Uh, Dan Caprio, McKenna Long and Aldridge. Um, this has been a wonderful panel. I hear violent agreement uh, on both sides of the Atlantic on the need to protect privacy and enable uh, innovation. Uh, Mark spoke about the role of the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. in terms of uh, enforcement authority. I guess my, my question for the MEPs is, as you go forward, you know, with the with the goal of a horizontal framework, um, review, with the review of the data directive and cloud computing, you mentioned the issue of fragmentation. How do you see that playing out, in you know, in a practical sense going forward, given given the you know the the relationship of the member states and the DPAs, uh, in a, in a practical level, how do, you know as as MEPs, how will you think about that as as the as the framework continues uh, to move through Parliament. No, no, we don't fight. <laughs> of course, I, I think that uh, the more earlier we can work on the wording and the definitions of the new contexts of uh, our laws and uh, references for uh, negotiations, commercial negotiations, the better it is. Uh, because uh, when we uh, consider uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the questions are sometimes uh, just taken in the agenda uh, we have, you know, in the discussions between governments, uh, the problem is for the, <laughs> the legislator uh, to, to be a bit before, uh, you know, this type of negotiation. So the convergence for me is also in the work of the legislators. That's why, that's why TPN is so important in the moment. If we could have a common agenda on some issues together to have the same definitions and the same vision, it would be enormous results uh, because after that, you know, Diabolo is in details and we can discuss for months about some two or three words because we don't have the same understanding and we, can, uh, we cannot lose time uh, for the moment and we need also for the market and for the uh, uh, stability of internet uh, do uh, quicker. I think, I think I agree, fully agree with you, I mean, uh, with uh, Catherine. I think uh, these um, platforms and these uh, forums like uh, 
the TPN and the transatlantic uh, week, uh, you know, uh, is is uh, at most importance in terms of trying to go on. I think it is important. Yesterday, I remember in one of the debates, someone say, "Well, we got an agreement between the business side, and then, you, but we need the kind of leadership able to put uh, all these agreements uh, in place, you know." And then I think uh, in in that sense, uh, it is uh, would be extremely important not to have just uh, this uh, week, but between uh, the annual weeks we have to be able to, to have uh, the possibility to deal with that and with, if you uh, deal with this, uh, those uh, uh, problems in advance, then when you are in the debate, you can at least, in our case, to really go further, you know, in terms of uh, approaching uh, views. Well, Erica, thank you uh, so much for chairing this panel today. And, and in conclusion, let, let me just note that these dialogues between the U.S. Congress and the European Union, going back now for more than a decade, um, starting from the time that the European Internet Foundation was formed, uh, shortly after our American Internet Caucus was formed, uh, I think have been tremendously helpful. We understand the developments that are occurring on both sides. And I think we all strive to make sure that there are not policies evolving on either side that interrupt the flow of commerce. So I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to take part today. And I hope we'll continue to have these dialogues because they're just a great aid in terms of coordinated policy making. Rick, thank you so much and uh, good luck. And I hope we will stay um, in connection in the future and can share many more meetings. Thanks so much again.